Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. So today I'm going to sketch this group of houses in the forest and um, I came across these houses last year on a hike and I immediately found the scene interesting and uh, I think what drew me to this was the kind of the, the arrangement of the houses themselves and also the really spooky atmosphere in this sort of dark looking houses um, maybe even um, I wanted to know does someone live there what is their story and uh, what's maybe behind these houses in the forest does something wait there and uh, stuff like this went through my mind so um, I've condensed the drawing process a little bit. You can see I did a preliminary drawing with some light pencil lines and now I'm redefining my lines uh, with um, a softer pencil, maybe a, a 2B or a B pencil. And I'm trying to pay attention to the roofs and uh, sort of the different arrangements of the planes and the, the shapes. And I want to get all of these details right in my sketch before I proceed to adding watercolor over this. And I hope you can see enough details of the scene on, in the small reference on the left. And uh, so basically I'm working from this photo reference for this sketch. I often do this, I often when I go uh, outside and I see something that interests me, I collect these um, photos that I put into a folder and then when I um, don't know what I could paint or when I need some inspiration then I look through the folder and usually something catches my interest. So there are lots of little details like the bushes in front of the house and uh, the fence poles and I want to get all of these just right so that I don't have to do the heavy lifting later on with the watercolors. So I want to have a really uh, detailed pencil sketch in place. About the paper, I'm using cotton paper here. This is Windsor at Newton Hot Press. Uh, I really like this paper because it has just a very slight amount of um, texture, of structure on the top. So despite being hot press paper, you still can get a little bit of structure out of your paint. And it's not so hard to paint on like other hot press papers, which are really, really smooth and don't have any structure at all. And it's also very nice, um, as all hot press papers are, for pencil sketches. This is why I like it so much. making sense of all of these different uh, branches and tree parts is always something that needs a little bit of time and a keen eye to figure out. And for the background trees it's not as important because those will, well, they will recede in the background. So I'm leaving those uh, a little bit more loose, but I'm taking my time for the trees in, in the immediate foreground. And I think I shared the sketch version of this painting in one of my videos about the Folktale Landscapes project. So if you're interested in this and if you want to learn more about uh, this entire project, then uh, please take a look at that video. Uh, it will all make more sense if, if you watch that. So this is an ongoing series where I look at landscapes from a narrative point of view, so to speak, and I want to see if um, the atmosphere in certain landscapes can be translated to paintings or sketches, rather. So I'm switching to watercolors, and the first thing that I want to get down is uh, part of the background trees. So I'm mixing different uh, muddy or natural looking green tones and I'm applying, well, sort of light washes. I think this is actually quite dark. 
So I'm mixing different greens for the different trees. Here you can see an evergreen tree. I think this was a group of spruces and they always have this nice intense dark green that's so beautiful to look at and to paint. By the way, this is a great um, tree to paint with perlin green. I don't have this in my small palette right now, but if you don't want to mix this um, this dark green color, then take a look at perlin green. It's it's a really useful uh, pigment for landscape painting. But you can also mix a similar color from uh, any convenience green like sap green and then sepia and a bit of ultramarine. So this is what I probably did here. It's been a while since I painted this, so I have to find my way into the painting process again. So the meadow in the front, I don't want this to look too garish. So I'm using a green with a, a tiny bit of uh, yellow or ochre um, in it to make it a, a little bit less garish. And I'm dropping in the pigment. So the nice thing about cotton paper is, is that you can work with um, a lot of water on your page. And you don't have to pay attention uh, as much as you would with um, wood paste paper. So cellulose paper. So it always makes sense to... Um, use cotton paper if you want to learn these techniques, even if you're doing just sketches, because um, you can only learn on these uh, special techniques on the right kind of paper. And I know it's it's very, it's usually very expensive, the 100% uh, cotton paper, but it's also very worth it. It also depends on what you're doing for. Um, I don't know, for wildlife or plant sketches that don't use a lot of layering, you'll probably get away, or not probably, I know this, you'll get away with using uh, cheaper cellulose paper. But for these kind of landscapes where you add lots of layers and have lots of washes with, um, with water and where you want to do wet and wet, then it's really easier to use this kind of cotton paper. So you can see I added a few patches in the background for the green, for the trees. And now I'm working my way um, towards the details in the foreground trees. I'm really taking my time for these bushes. And then we have this interesting greenhouse in the foreground. And I have to make sure that this will stand apart from the green of the background and from the uh, green bushes on the left of the house. So I need to get this uh, green house really uh, darker than the surroundings. As you can see in the reference, um, it's, it's also a different shade of green. And for some contrast, I have mixed the color of the roof with a, a bit of burnt sienna bit of sepia and a little bit of one of my reds. So it always makes sense to not just uh, blindly follow your reference if you have one, but to take into account what kind of atmosphere do you want to uh, create in your painting, what colors play well together, what colors um, do evoke this kind of atmosphere and this is always something I think about. It can also help to uh, limit your the colors on your palette and this way you will really get a very harmonic painting that works well together because if you don't have too many colors then you only have so many mixing choices uh, available to you and this will definitely help to get maybe not a 100% realistic painting in terms of color choices, but you will get colors that play well together. So for any given uh, painting or sketch in the series, I usually don't use all of the colors in my palette that I have available. So even my small palettes have up to 20 colors in them. And I don't use them all in one painting. I still like to have um, the choice and the versatility for the many different 
subjects that I uh, choose to paint. So as you know, I usually sketch nature, so wildlife and plants and uh, all kinds of natural subjects. And for this, I need a, a really a big selection of colors. And then I also have these landscape paintings. And from time to time, I sketch people or houses. And so I want a well-rounded palette that can serve me everywhere I go. Not, um, I don't choose different palettes for different subjects. I just take my very generalist small uh, painting kit out there and then see what I need for a particular painting. And I'm explaining this because I get asked this a lot of times. So people ask me, oh, do you have different palettes for different subjects? And to me, this seems like a lot more work than you need to do. So you just assemble a really good generalist um, small palette for all kinds of subjects and then you choose the paintings for your individual sketch. Uh, each time you choose the colors that you want for the, the actual sketch that you're doing. Okay, back to the painting. You can see I have added uh, lots of color and lots of structure around the houses here. There's this um, sort of this shed that has interesting wooden structures to it and I'm also adding the windows and other details and textures on the roof making everything a little bit darker. Remember how I said that you need to have contrast between the fore and the background. So this is what I'm trying to to bring out more here in my painting. This scene has a lot of neutral colors. I'm using a lot of sepia, a lot of um, earth tones here. So uh, yellow ochre and also toned down versions of the colors that are in my palette. So I don't use a bright red for the roof. I instead I mix my colors so that they aren't as intense. And I think this adds to the overall atmosphere of this uh, scene. And what I do sometimes to keep the painting process easier is that I add the details first and that I add a color or shadow over this later. So this will probably, it doesn't always work and you have to really let the other layer dry. But um, it, for the for the shed on the left, you can see that I added these small lines and in a minute or so I will add a, a bit of darker color, darker wash over this. And for me, this helps to keep um, the internal structure of the painting a little bit better. I don't know, but um, th this, it can really help to just paint things as they are. Here you can see me going over the shed with the darker wash. And uh, it really helps me to make sense of the things that I'm painting more. But um, yeah, it, unfortunately it doesn't always work and sometimes you will um, dissolve the lines that you painted before. So you really have to let things dry and also it also depends on the paper. But sometimes it works and then it's, it's a really nice technique. It's a bit more like digital painting actually where you can uh, change things after uh, you painted details and just paint over them, so to speak. So I'm in the detail stage, as you can see. I'm adding more interesting textures to roofs and to buildings. And I'm also bringing out my colored pencils here which are uh, an easier way to get um, smooth and crisp lines. So if you want some areas where you have really thin lines and really want to define something and don't want to use a small brush, then you can also use colored pencils. And I find the foreground needs a little bit more work, this um, meadow in the foreground. So I think before I add any details, like now, I uh, need to add a lot more color. So right there, I'm dropping it in. So the foreground can be warmer. Uh, it can be a little bit brighter. And then we have these interesting grasses that are right there in the foreground. 
and I'm adding them with yellow ochre. So I've, I've left this space white until now because I knew I wanted this really yellow bright color. And I didn't want to muddy things up. Again, I'm using the help of my colored pencil here. And basically these are already the finishing touches, so I'm adding a bit more uh, green here and there. In these areas of transition, you might say. So a bit more shadow in a few areas, a few more branches. And then one thing that I haven't added in yet is uh, the, the fence. I still need to do that. And you can see in the reference it's a white uh, fence. And I'm using gouache for that and um, a very thin rigger brush. So these are brushes that have very long slender tips and they take on a lot of paint and you can make very nice thin continuous long lines with them. So this kind of brush is perfect for what I want to do here. And I try to apply the white gouache really um, almost in a creamy state, non-diluted, so that it won't sink into the pigment that's already there. And another thing that I noticed is that I have one area that's still not very well defined. So I want to have this dark background from the shed and then have um, brighter branches in front of it. So I have to add a bit more contrast to this scene, to this area. And with dark sepia I have the dark background and now I can go over it with gel pen. So in some areas, uh, in some cases, gel pen works well, in some cases it doesn't. There's really not a rule to this. Um, I usually prefer to use what you just saw me do, the, the rigger brush with the white gouache. It's, it's much easier. Now um, we will remove, or rather I will remove the masking tape. My painting is finished. It's always a really nice moment when you remove the tape. And basically that's the finished sketch. So I sort of like how this one turned out really true to the atmosphere that I was looking for. So uh, that's it for this video. I really hope you enjoyed it and as always feel free to comment, like and subscribe. Uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you very soon. Bye!